Welcome back to my course, uh, The History of Socialism. Today, our topic is Socialist Calculation Debate. Let me briefly remind to you what we discussed last time. We had the lecture on the rise of communism, the movement and the intellectual trend that became possible because of the radicalization of the entire life of Europe, North America, and the rest of the world. The war disrupted people's lives. The war destroyed the faith in constitution, in democratic procedures, in republican institutions. The war led to mobilization, martial methods, the faith in strong hand, authoritarianism. So these were the notions that became popular during and, and in the wake of the First World War. So communism, the radical version of socialism, became possible because of this entire martial mobilization, because of this entire martial mindset that uh, won the minds of many people during that time, I repeat, during World War I and in the wake of World War I. We also talked about the Bolshevik Revolution, 1917, when Lenin, Trotsky, and uh, Russian communists, who were called Bolsheviks, they came to power and they decided to establish the dictatorship of the proletariat. They wanted to practice so-called war communism and we found out what it meant it meant the abolition of prices abolition of uh, monetary economy uh, rationing the state control over agriculture over industry total nationalization elimination of trade elimination of money and switch to their in-kind, in-kind barter exchange, the war communism. We also realized that how disastrous were the economic results of this war communism system, which became clear by 1921. We also stress that it was not only the war which amplified this authoritarianism, martial methods, mobilization. It was, it, it, it was also something that had been injected from the very beginning in the socialist thought collector. This desire for centralized planning, the desire to plant in charge of society, so-called enlightened masters, managers who would navigate society to the greater future, who would plan economy down to each minuscule detail. Okay. Today we are going to talk about those few people who tried to challenge this dominant mindset, authoritarian martial mindset. We are going to mention a few names of those people who were very unpopular in 1920s, 1930s, but who did try to question not only the basics of the communist economy, but also the general uh, principles of the socialist, general pre principles of socialism, socialist economy, so different brands of socialism. And this attempt to criticize socialism by a few people who came to doubt the basic notions of socialism became known as the socialist calculation debate that started in 1920. But before we do this, let me uh, briefly outline to you again the entire 
environment. We, we need to put this thing in the context. And in fact, the reason I reminded to you what we did last time again to bring to our discussion the whole historical context. Okay. In order to give you more context, so let me highlight that what happened in uh, 1970 in Russia, it wasn't an exception. Okay. We are talking about the emergence of so-called the Communist International, so radical groups of people who wanted to radicalize socialism, who wanted to switch to communism, okay? who wanted to replicate the Bolshevik experience in the wake of this successful Russian revolution. Okay? There were a few other revolutions. From 1917 to 1923, there were several attempts in Europe to replicate what Bolsheviks did in Russia. The first was Germany, of course. Germany was the cradle of socialism, of, of the organized socialism. Remember, we mentioned this. In Germany in 1918, when the country was on the brink of the collapse, remember the so-called allies at France, England, and the United States, they imposed a peace agreement on Germany, blamed this country in uh, initiating World War I, although Germany was not the only one that was responsible. And eventually Germany uh, was bullied and had to sign this uh, very une unequal peace agreement with the three Western countries, U.S., England, and France. And in this turmoil, when Germany was collapsing, 1918-1919, there were radical left elements who became fascinated with the Russian Revolution, who wanted to repeat the same experience. So we have revolts in Berlin, in other parts of the country, workers, sailors, some troops against the regime uh, in an attempt to bring up the communist revolution. Okay, And soon this revolution failed. Even though the Socialist Democratic Party of Germany became split in two parts, the radical element, okay, radical element, which was headed by, by the way, by Rosa Luxemburg and her uh, friend, uh, Karl Lipknecht. Remember, we talked about Rosa Luxemburg, this uh, cosmopolitan, firebrand, Polish, Jewish, Russian, German, cosmopolitan, that um, uh, advoca advocated uh, spontaneous uh, working class revolt. Okay, so she uh, was one of these uh, people who were in charge of this German revolution. Okay, but it was doomed it was an abortive revolution soon these spontaneous revolts were put down and people actually who put down these revolutions were social democrats social democrats so the mainstream social democrats who didn't want barricades who didn't want a violence so they denounced the left wing of their own party which split away okay the split away faction became known as independent social democrats and later by the way out of this independent social democratic faction a communist party of germany emerged in 1990 okay so we have these two elements independent socials socialist democratic party and the emerging communist party bending together Rosa Luxemburg, Karl Liebknecht, trying to bring up a communist revolution in Germany. And they failed because their comrades who were against the socialist revolution, who were, didn't want to replicate the Bolshevik experience, who defended this the Bernstein way. Remember, we talked about Eduard Bernstein. So we need this peaceful transition to socialism. We need to switch to socialism. Um, by by ballot box, okay, in a slow, in a gradual mode. So that's what frequently they do not mention. 
in history books. So it wasn't some kind of fascistic force that uh, became united against this uh, communist revolution in Germany in 1918-1919. It was the socialist, moderate social democrats. And ironically, these more moderate social democrats were headed by a man uh, named Noske. This Noske, the last name, was a worker, proletarian. Unlike those people who were in charge of Communist Party and uh, Independent Socialist Democratic Party were, that promoted the Communist Revolution. That's the irony of the situation. Okay, so eventually, this Noske, this guy Noske, who was um, who was against the Communist Revolution, he mobilized the war veterans, so-called Fry Corps, and sent them against. These, let's call them German Bolsheviks. Although I repeat, not all German communists, radicals agreed with Bolsheviks. Rosa Luxemburg, for instance, she was against this um, vanguard communist party, which was the core of uh, Vladimir Lenin's teaching. Okay. Anyway, Noske sends troops, war veterans against. Uh, radical comrades put them down and in fact hundreds of um, communists, radical socialists were executed again it was violence on both sides in fact if you look at this slide you will see that I also mentioned so called Bavarian Soviet Republic which also happened in Germany because you know that B Bavaria it's a big, um, the biggest province in addition to Prussia, one of the biggest provinces in Germany, in southern Germany. And um, the reason I singled it out is simply because after the uh, German revolution nationwide was defeated, defeated in this province, German province in the south, we have an independent attempt to stage a socialist revolution, okay, where a group of uh, communists and anarchists, uh, some of them were poets, some of them were just uh, vagrants without any occupations. There were a couple of uh, writers, okay, who banded together and in the wake of this abortive revolution decided kind of to do a follow-up experiment. Okay, seized the power and tried to establish Bavarian Soviet Republic in 1919. Okay, there was a, a group of intellectuals and eventually Bolshevik, who had connections to uh, Russia, Vladimir Lenin, this guy, his, uh, you see his picture here, takes the power, puts himself in charge of Bavarian Soviet Republic, trying to directly replicate the... Um, Bolshevik reforms, trying to nationalize the economy, socialize everything. Okay, his name was um, Eugen Levine. Levine, that's a German Jewish communist who had links to Bolsheviks. Okay. Um, this republic also failed because, again, social democrats, this moderate social democrats, sent the army. That war veterans, the army actually collapsed. It was just the war war veterans, which had been which were mobilized by the mainstream social democrats to put down these uh, uh, wild uh, anarchists. Okay, in fact, the Bavarian Soviet Republic was a, like a bizarre experiment because they um, <laughs> they adopted a bunch of bizarre reforms. Okay which went even beyond what Bolsheviks did in uh, Soviet Russia. For example, they adopted this decree that um, each uh, house shouldn't have more than three rooms, otherwise it would be unequal. Okay. Of course, they abolished money, and um, they also uh, opened universities to everybody, like free college education, and they said, that's the reason I'm mentioning this university business. They said all subjects should be studied in the universities except history. So they shut down history uh, because they claimed the history was um, 
harmful for civilization, for our civilizations. So they shut down history. History shouldn't be studied, but all other disciplines should be studied. So that was one of the reforms of Bavarian Soviet Republic, in addition to canceling money, okay, canceling everything that was related to the old regime. And of course, a lot of people protested this. Um, uh, a person, in fact, who was in charge of uh, housing was a, a street person who lived on streets, you know, with a vagrant who was with a criminal background, who was a professional thief. It's uh, amazing. And Bavaria was also a Catholic, uh, Catholic province with this uh, die-hard religious nationalistic um, sentiments. But the person whom they put in charge of education was a, a German Jewish poet so who tried to abolish religion so it was just a, a very bizarre that immediately antagonized people okay in, in a couple of months this experiment was shut down in addition to uh, these German experiments we have Finnish uh, socialist revolution one month 1918 that was quickly put down by Finnish nationalist forces because the majority of Finns were afraid that Finnish revolutionaries were agents of Russian Bolsheviks and Finland always wanted to get rid of the Russian domination, wanted to enjoy independence. So that is why socialist, inter socialist internationalists could not make, uh, hardly could make any case in Finland because the majority of Finnish people were pro-nationalists that wanted to gain independence. And finally, the biggest, the largest experiment after the communist revolution in Russia, it was Hungarian revolution. Hungarian revolution, 1919. 1919. When um, in the wake of the collapse of Austro-Hungary, remember Austro-Hungarian Empire, it was very big empire in Eastern Europe. Okay, not as large as Russian Empire, of course, but still uh, like the Russian Empire, multi-ethnic empire, which united a lot of countries okay like croatia slovenia hungary romania austria so the bunch of different nationalities so this uh, structure collapsed austro-hungarian empire and in the wake of this collapse because of this radicalization radicalization we have um hungarian socialist radicals come into power inspired by the bolsheviks for three months they were able to do all kind of reforms again the same thing abolishing money trade okay confiscating land uh, shutting down private property so all these things um i would like to bring to your attention the name of uh, one Otto Neurath. It's an Austrian German economist, okay, who worked actually for Bavarian Soviet Republic. Okay, and I bringing this name to your attention for for a reason. You will find out why. So the reforms which these socialist experiments, Bolshevik like socialist experiments in Europe, they pretty much were based on what we last time labeled war communism. Remember, we talked about war communism. So it's a radical reforms of nationalization. And for example, in Bavarian Socialist Republic, we have this guy who was asked by Bavarian socialists to come and to advise them how to build economy. So this economist, Marxist economist, Otto Neuroth, writes a book called Through War Economy to Economy in Kind. Okay, see the title. Through War Economy to Economy in Kind. So it's a Bolshevik-like urge for socialization. So let's socialize economy. So basically a call for total national nationalization. So there should be no room for private property. No room for private enterprise because private enterprise was evil, 
or tenor, like many other economists who considered themselves Marxist economists, they spoke against the anarchy of capitalism. They said, um, on the capitalism, when people compete, it creates the anarchy. Okay. So much is produced, nobody knows exactly how much should be produced, you know, it's, it's no good. People compete, it's a chaos, that's what they said. Um, there was this uh, popular notion that prices, among Marxist socialists, that prices and money should go away, should be abolished. And Otto Neurist made this case, so he used, man manipulated the numbers, digits, argue, making an argument in favor of this um, economy based on total nationalization. So all economy should be subjected by centralized planning, centralized planning, okay? So he argued that statisticians and accountants, they would do a much better job instead of private entrepreneurs in figuring out what people need, what prices should be set up, what services should be provided to the pop population on the ground. So we need to keep this army of statisticians and accountants in order to um, plan our entire economy down to minuscule details. Okay. And um, as you probably know, those of you who studied history, that uh, money during the war became worthless. There was inflation, governments printed money. And of course, in the minds of the people, it was evil. So let's abolish money completely. So here you can see a lady in Germany that uses money to um, start the fire in her stove. Okay. In Germany, especially, inflation was huge, like 300%. So like in uh, present-day Zimbabwe. So money became worthless. People were losing respect for uh, monetary economy. And that's how, in the minds of many people, this um, sentiment emerged that, oh, let's get rid of this monetary economy. It's no good. So we need to switch to in-kind economy. And of course many Marxist experts capitalized on this notion. And this guy, whose picture I showed to you, Otto North, he was one of these people. But again, I mentioned his name for a reason. You will see why. The person who came to question this notion, the, uh, the person who came to question this popular notion of the time was Ludwig von Mises. An Austrian economist who jump started so called an Austrian school, okay, or an Austrian school in economics. He was a prolific uh, scholar. He had been born in the um, town of Lemberg, Austro Hungarian Empire, eastern part of uh, Austro Hungarian Empire, or today it's uh, part of Ukraine present-day city of, uh, city of Lviv, okay, in the western Ukraine, Galicia, Galicia. So he was born in a family of uh, a rich man, uh, Austrian-Jewish guy. He was sent, Ludwig von Mises, to study uh, at Vienna University, okay. Then he worked for Austrian Chamber of Commerce, uh, later, when Nazi came to power, uh, seized Austria in 1934, when Hitler seized Austria, so he, at first he escaped to Switzerland, and then he moved to the United States, where he taught for a while, until 1973 when he died. Mises and uh, his student Friedrich von Hayek, they pioneered so-called Austrian School of Economics. Okay. It was a marginal school. Nobody heard about them. Okay. And for a long time, until 
1970s, 1970s, until the end of the last century, hardly anybody heard about them, okay? These Austrians, so-called Austrians, they um, didn't buy this popular sentiment that entire economy should be centralized and planned. And I repeat, this popular notion that all economies should be planned, uh, heavily planned, regulated from up above, it was the most popular notion that was widespread both on the right and on the left, especially on the left, of course. Okay. In, uh, among the Bolsheviks, we see this notion in its extreme. So Austrians, Austrians questioned the very the core notion of this centralized planning. They said, we need to focus on individual behavior. So what the individuals on the ground need, instead of big aggregates such as classes, racial, ethnic groups, corporations, okay? So classes, ethnic, racial, religious groups, corporations, they're important, but these are just collectives. And these collectives have, have individual people, people with their individual interests, with the individual aspirations. So that's what we need to take into consideration, okay? Um, Ludwig von Mises, and Austrians, they think that competition leads to natural, quote-unquote, planning from down below, decentralized, natural, social planning. Uh, Mises and Hayek, they were against uh, top-to-down planning that was very popular in the first half of the 20th century. I repeat. The sentiment that everything should be planned was extremely popular in the first half of the last century. Austrians were very marginal, unpopular, until the 1970s. By the way, uh, Hayek, Friedrich Hayek, whose name I mentioned, who was a student of Mises, he also went to Vienna University. Hayek, uh, he was um, Austrian, pure Austrian, who belonged to an old aristocratic Austrian lineage. Von Hayek, von Hayek, okay. Um, in fact, he um, came from a family of scholars. His father was a scholar. His uh, um, one of his relatives was Wittgenstein, one of the famous philosophers, Western philosophers, Wittgenstein. He became interested in economy. He was a soldier, by the way, Hayek, served in the military, Austro-Hungarian military during the war, was wounded. Okay, He had some social sympathies, but when he started to study economy on the Mises. So he quickly became disillusioned with socialism. So he became uh, friends, colleagues with Mises. And together, they jump-started so-called uh, the socialist calculation debate, Okay, the topic of our conversation. So Mises was exposed to that book written by this guy. Otto Neuerth, okay, he, he reads the book, he lives through this book, through war economy to economy in kind. Okay, I give you this English translation, but of course it was published in German. So Mises reads this book, and this book um, appeared to him so ridiculous. So his uh, whole project that we need to abolish money, we need to switch to in-kind economy, so uh, total equity, everybody should be equal, equal outcomes, okay, equal outcomes that statisticians and accountants should be in charge. So it looked to him so ridiculous, to Mises. So he decided to write an essay. He writes an essay that became famous and, um, in 1970s, 1980s. I'm jumping ahead here when... Uh, communism and socialism in general started to crumble in many countries. 
a lot of people became interested in this work. I repeat, before, hardly anybody had been interested in the views of Ludwig von Mises. But when um, socialist economies started to collapse, crumble in 1970s, 80s, 90s, last century. So many people became interested in this work. And the title of this work, I gave you to read this work. You can go by the link I gave you and read this work. It's a very short work, uh, very easy to grasp. The title is Economic Calculation in the Socialist Commonwealth, 1920s. Okay. So basically, the major question Mises posed in this work was, can the state organize economic production better than the market? The central question. And of course, 90% um, of people, especially intellectuals in his uh, time, responded in a positive way to this question. Yes, the state can and should, must, <laughs> organize economic production and it, the state does it much better than the market okay Mises challenged socialists he said please explain how precisely your system should work that's what many socialists avoided okay they avoided to answer this question they said hey everything should be planned prices should be set by the state but they didn't want to go into details and this debate actually continued um, through 1930s in even uh, in 1940s okay again a little bit more context for you so austria was by the way one of these areas of europe that also became susceptible to this mainstream notion that we do need to mobilize nationalize entire economy for the greater good okay we need to abolish money we need to ration and that's what would help austrian social democrats headed by this guy otto bauer see the name otto bauer austrian social democrats they did not exactly love what bolsheviks were doing in Russia, like the dictatorship, everything, but they liked economic reforms of Bolsheviks. So we need to shut down private companies. We do need monopolize entire economy. We need to plan economy by the state. Okay. Social Democrats in Austria said, yes, Bolsheviks uh, used the red tear. They didn't allow freedom of press. This is not good, so we're not going to accept this. But they were in a total agreement, Austrian Social Democrats, moderates. They were in a total agreement with the economic methods of the Bolsheviks. They also wanted nationalization, okay, because it was the mainstream notion. The mainstream notion. But ironically, Ludwig von Mises was friends with Otto Bauer. No. Earlier, they were friends in college years. So he worked for uh, Vienna Chamber of Commerce. So he comes to Otto Bauer. This is the major voice, major socialist voice in Austria in 1919, who wanted to, who was about to. Um, shut down private enterprise in Austria and he talks with him for the whole night and he uses all his influence to convince him don't do it do not shut down private enterprise do not shut down the monetary economy okay and Otto Bauer listened to his friend at least he decided not to do it at this point Okay, and that's what, by the way, allowed Austria to survive for a while. Okay, because um, market economy was not eliminated. There were elements of market that survived in Austria, 1919, 1920, 1921, and that's what allowed Austria 
to persist. Otherwise, it would have been like Bolshevik Russia, where the famine, production would have stopped. But ironically, and that is why I'm sharing with you this example. Ironically, even though he allowed himself to be swayed by Mises at this point, so late in 1920s, he totally severed Ottobar, his relationships with Mises. Why? Because they were, he was mad at Mises. Because he thought, he felt guilty that he allowed himself to be convinced by this quote-unquote right-winger Mises who didn't let him shut down the economy. Okay, he was convinced that he led this guy to betray his own socialist ideas. Okay, so socialists, Austrian socialists in general, and Otto Bauer in particular, they never forgave Mises for doing this. <laughs> so, what does it tell us? That it tells us that. Um, what Otto Bauer, what socialists wanted at that time. That was the mainstream ideas. The mainstream ideas. So what Mises suggested, it was marginal. It was not popular at that time. Okay. Again, again, and again, throughout this presentation, I uh, will return to this notion that we need to take into consideration so-called the spirit of the time, the spirit of the time, what Germans called by this expression Zeitgeist. So Zeit, time, geist, ghost or spirit. So Zeitgeist, the spirit of the time. So the spirit of the time was centralized planning, nationalization. Even though some people realized that it could harm economy. So a lot of people didn't want to think about it. They thought if you would share everything if you plan everything it would make people happy and eventually it would contribute to the rise of economy okay as a historian i would like to stress that throughout history you probably know better than me you can see how people either can vote against their own interests or support the causes which totally harm them for different reasons, for different circumstances, out of jealousy, out of, um, for opportunistic reasons, because the majority is convinced, okay? For example, at that time, the majority of people in Eastern Europe were con convinced that freedom of press is not good. A lot of people in general throughout Europe became convinced that republic, constitution, elections, it was not good. It didn't work out. Because the war made some made them so angry, so desperate, okay, that the faith in uh, constitutional <coughs> constitutional institutions, sorry, it doesn't sound good, but anyway, the faith in uh, Republican institutions and the Constitution so weakened. Um that people started to opt for a strong hand. So that is why we have entire Europe seized in the hands of dictators in the interwar period, 1920s, 1930s. Almost each European country was seized by a dictator, except on Switzerland. England, of course, was monarchy. Sweden was monarchy. Okay, But the rest of the countries were dictatorships. Or oh, Czechoslovakia was an exception. But eventually she, uh, she became a dictatorship too in 1939. Anyway, the time, the spirit of the time dictated how people should behave. So people like Otto Bauer, socialist, were totally convinced they should follow this mainstream notion. We sh they should mobilize economists because all books write about it. Remember, we mentioned a lot of books argued this. And that's how it should be done. Okay. And you can find the examples of these uh, 
sentiments which people support, harmful sentiments throughout history. Even right now, for instance, if you look at our American scene, you may see that uh, some groups of people support uh, causes or sentiments uh, which, uh, if you look deeply into them, they totally harm interests of the people. But those people who support them, they're sincerely convinced that it it works to benefit people. Okay, That's the whole thing. reason I emphasize it is that I'm against, as a historian, uh, against this notion that... Um, People are evil, or certain politicians are evil, or um, specific activists are evil, or like in our case, Otto Bauer, that he wanted to screw up Austrians. Okay, I'm going to shut down the private enterprise, I'm going to nationalize the entire economy, I'm going to ration food because I'm such an evil person. Okay, no, no. He was a totally sincere man who wanted to improve the living conditions of Austrians. Okay, but he was driven by these popular notions that we need to totally transform, to change the entire country in order to improve living conditions of the people. Okay, so he believed he was a true believer, and that is why he was so upset that he allowed this guy Mises to convince him, at least for a while, not to shut down private enterprise economy in Austria that he didn't allow, for a while at least, to cancel money <laughs> in Austria, okay? What Mises argued, okay, now going back to Mises and his work, the socialist calculation in the uh, economic calculation in the socialist commonwealth. Mises argued that socialism was impossible because it disregarded real prices. He stressed that it was impossible to calculate millions of prices and take into consideration millions of consumer needs because all of us, millions of people, we are in the human individuals with our own minds, with our own emotions, with our own sentiments. Even though, um, let's say, proletarians, working class people belong to the same class, okay? or some manufacturers belong to the same class. Still, they are very different people. In fact, among manufacturers, we might have a rich guy who might sympathize with socialists. Or among working class people, we have some kind of uh, um, segment of people who want to live a life of a bourgeois. Or um, some workers might dream about having like a, a small um, house in the countryside who wants to quit his work. Or... Some people don't like to buy certain things, you know, they have particular needs, you know, who like to wear particular clothing, who like to eat particular food, okay? So, um, you cannot calculate millions of uh, prices in millions of consumer needs, okay? He argued that if you try to do it on a grand scale to introduce the centralized planning down to a, to a minuscule detail, what you, what you would get you will get so-called planned chaos. So it's an uh, expression belongs to Mises. He said, those countries which introduce total planning from up above, trying to plan everything and everywhere, from sea to shining sea, like in, uh, <laughs> in the case of Russia, from Baltic Sea to Pacific Ocean, everything was planned. Okay? So what do you get? You get planned chaos. Chaos. Um, Resources cannot be allocated productively. Where if you uh, set up prices, if you enforce prices, so capital goods, machines, plants, okay, capital goods. If you set prices for these things, so like so big giant plans for uh, particular machines, assembly lines, tractors. You cannot allocate them productively, because, in, in including other resources, 
any kind of resource if you try to set in stone its price you will not allow to allocate this resource productively okay which means if for instance um, I set a particular price for a tractor let's say lower than a market price so soon we will have no tractors because they will be sold and there will there wouldn't be enough of them okay but if you allow market to decide the price for tractors or for shoes for instance like shoes the one of the best examples okay for example if you set prices for shoes below the market value you will see no shoes in stores okay because people will would buy them and might end up in the black market but if you allow market to set the prices organically spontaneously so what you will see you will see the shoes in in, in, the, in the stores in the regular stores because the market would decide the price of the shoe um mises argued that um and of course he looked at the soviet russia because soviet russia was the only country where socialism quote unquote succeeded at least the regime was established that claimed to build socialism right because in other countries it failed in hungary in hungary by the way where socialism existed for three months it was eventually squashed by romanian troops um, who invaded hungary okay so on the bolshevik rush it could serve as a blueprint of the socialist economy okay so mises looked at the bolsheviks what they did and he said look the state owned companies firms enterprises the state imposes quotas on how much should be produced shoes pencil tractors the state chooses managers and normally these man managers were members of the communist party bolsheviks the state statistics agency collects data on inputs and outputs and the state planning board or agency sets the prices based on what on state goals so we have for instance in a communist state for example russia 1920 had particular political goals what do we need we need to build factories okay so we are going to invest everything in factories how artificially invest in money by the state will we gather all resources we extract resources we rob the peasants we invest this money into um, industry and that's what happened in uh, russia by the way later 10 years after mises wrote his um, brochure 1920 the 1920 brochure in 1930 stalin started to build industry by the willpower his own willpower and uh, the bolshevik leadership they decided to invest all money all money into building industry military industry chemical industry electric industry by doing what by robbing peasants extracting resource resources from peasants robbing them imposing quarter quotas on peasants forcing peasants to deliver grain okay as much as possible and as a result of this confiscation campaign uh, uh, more than five million peasants in russia ukraine died were sacrificed for the industrial revolution because by the willpower the government decided to allocate resources to extract resources from agriculture and invest them into industry okay instead of allowing natural peasants on the ground expand their agriculture bolsheviks remember bolsheviks on the nep they didn't allow peasants to spread their wings they put the caps on how much labor they should hire how much they should uh, deliver to the market how much they should deliver to state coffers how much taxes they should pay so agriculture was heavily regulated but the point here is that mises said 
the state did not allow market to allocate resources in a natural, organic way, okay? Practicing what could be called this planned chaos when by the willpower, the socialist managers on the top, they decided how to dispose these resources. In fact, you can see here um, a cartoon by the way, it's a cartoon from a German social democratic magazine. Stalin sitting in front of uh, cover, drowned in the paperwork, sitting and watching on the chart that shows how socialist economy supposedly should develop. You know, that's kind of uh, a very revealing cartoon that shows how socialist bureaucrats were literally drowned, drowned in papers. Okay, because they wanted to calculate everything. See, it's another interesting part of socialist economy where they want to have uh, the army of statisticians and accountants to calculate the prices on the ground, to calculate how much, how many resources they should allocate to this branch of economy or to that branch of economy, which gives rise to huge bureaucracy. That's what Russia became, a huge bureaucratic state, huge bu bureaucratic state. So the resources were allocated on the basis uh, of feel and intuition. Lenin and later Stalin created the enormous bureaucracy, the command and control bureaucracy, because they aspired to plan everything. I repeat, down to a minuscule detail. In fact, um, Stalin literally was moaning, so complaining, trying to get rid of this paper trail which was forced on him by his subordinates because Russian state was heavily centralized, communist state was heavily centralized, like a ver vertical, vertical structure. And, I'm sorry, bureaucrats down below were afraid to take an initiative. So they delegated responsibility to high, the, those bureaucrats who, who, who were high above them, and the high above were also afraid to take responsibility. They all, all, always wanted to um, be approved by higher bureaucrats. It's like, take like, for instance, a university, any university, or take like VA uh, Veterans Administration, or VA hospitals. That's how it's done, because each small bureaucrat in these uh, places, which can be called the pockets of socialism, the bureaucrats are afraid to take responsibility and they delegate, at least share the signatures, share responsibility with other bureaucrats um, on the same level or with especially those bureaucrats who are high above them, okay? In order to avoid responsibility in case something goes wrong, okay? Because they are not interested, you know, bureaucrats e either are not interested at all or little interested in uh, what's going on uh, on the ground, they are more interested in securing their, their own positions, salaries, okay? So they wanted to protect their bots. Any bureaucrat wants to protect his or her bot. It's, it's just the nature of bureaucracy, okay? And in order to do this, they try to delegate responsibility to as many people as possible. And of course, in a company, especially in a medium company, a small company, in a small business that doesn't work this way. Their people take risks because they risk their own money. Either they take risk or not. Okay, Bureaucrats do not behave this way because they don't risk their own money. They risk their positions. So they want to secure their positions. Unlike private ent entrepreneur who wants to secure his or her income, her profit, okay? To secure his or her profit uh, in case of bureaucrats, they want to secure their income, stable income, and the position. Okay, so you have very different notions. For example, in uh, his book, there's a best book on Stalinist economy uh, written by um, American economic historian. His name is Paul, Paul Gregory. Paul Gregory, if you want, you can Google it. So he wrote a book on Stalinist economy where he provides interesting facts. First, 
in archives he found a bunch of documents that record complaints of Stalin to his subordinates. He said, do not bring me this avalanche of papers. You know, I, I have no time to deal with them. For example, Stalin had to decide, Paul Gregory found in archives, that Stalin had to decide to buy an oil, oil tanker or not. So which, under normal circumstances, should be done some uh, lower level bureaucrat. On one occasion, uh, he had to debate with his Politburo, Politburo, it's oligarchy that ruled the Soviet Union. They were sitting and debating, should they sell 200 trucks to Mongolia or not? Again, should the steel pipes should be imported or produced domestically? It's a very trivial questions that had to be decided on the top of the pyramid by Stalin himself. So Mises argued that centralized planning was doomed to fail. So from the very beginning, as, uh, as early as 1920, when the Bolshevik regime only existed for only for three years, he already concluded, Mises, Ludwig von Mises, that centralized planning uh, was doomed because it was logically impossible. Because it failed, because it, not because it was logically impossible, I'm sorry, but because it could not deal with self-interest of human beings, okay? Socialist calculation, the socialist calculation debate, in fact, went through two, uh, through two stages. During the first stage, we have Mises challenging these Bolshevik reforms and particularly um, projects suggested by this guy, Otto Neurath, okay. Mises argued that socialist economy was impossible, impossible because it could not deal with self-interest of human beings. But there was a second stage of this debate, the second, second stage in 1930s, when we have another guy coming to the picture, Oskar Lange, a Polish economist. On the one hand, and Friedrich von Hayek takes the torch, the student of Mises, on the other hand. Who was Oskar Lange? Oskar Lange was a social democratic act activist. He was a, a, a Polish socialist of a German origin. So he grew up in a Polish German family in Western Poland. Okay. He was a, uh, a local socialist activist in Poland. Then um, he moves to the United States and lives in the United States in 1930s. And he teaches in Minnesota. He actually published um, uh, several articles here in the United States. He published a book on socialist economy. Okay. Oscar Lange said, we should be grateful to Professor Mises for pointing to us that socialist, socialism was logically impossible because I'm going to argue opposite that socialism was the socialism is and will be possible, would be possible. Why? Because Professor Mises did point to something what we socialists should resolve. Okay. And what Oscar Lange started to argue became known as mar market socialism. Market socialism. Okay. Today, by the way, market socialism is the mainstream conviction of socialists okay for example in the united states you heard about um, dem so-called democratic socialists or if you go to europe uh, you can see um, socialist party of france or if you go to uk you will see uh, la the labor party uk labor party and jeremy corbyn all of them um, agree with this notion of market socialism. So what does it mean? Oscar Lange argued that yes, there was a problem with the Soviet-type economy, total state control. 
the state cannot totally control everything. That's what he argued. Ironically, I will allow myself um, a rem digression. Even though, personally, Oscar Lange argued that Soviet economy was not exactly a good thing, it cannot function because everything was controlled by the state. In his politics, real politics, Lange was a so-called fellow traveler. So he supported the Soviet Union in 1930s, 1940s, politically, on international arena, because he thought, oh, it was a good force to fight against fascism. In fact, at some point, he colluded with the Soviet um, secret police. He received a nickname <laughs> from Soviet secret police, alias. Um, his alias was uh, the friend, the friend. And he was mentioned in the so-called Vinona files. Vinona files, it's... Uh, Secret interception, uh, OSC, OSS, it's a predecessor, CIA did when intercepting Soviet cables from New York and Washington to Moscow, where they were able to catch uh, name of Oscar Lange, not his name, but uh, his nickname, and eventually it was linked to Oscar Lange, and Oscar Lange was promoted by Stalin to represent um, Poland in the United Nations when uh, United Nations was being organized in 1945. Oscar Lange um, made visits to the Soviet Union during World War II because Stalin wanted to put him uh, among these people who controlled the Polish resistance movement. Stalin didn't like uh, independent Polish resistance politicians didn't like the polish london gov london government that was in government because he couldn't control them but oscar lange who lived in the united states who had american citizenship so he was a very convenient uh, figurehead to be in charge of this um, polish resistance movement because uh, he was like a market socialist uh, living in the United States, but at the same time he secretly worked for the Soviet Union. <laughs> that is why he was a very convenient figure. And um, indeed, when uh, Stalin seized Poland in the wake of the Second World War, Oskar Lange quickly became one of the bosses of the communist regime in communist Poland in the wake of the Second World War. He was put literally in charge of the Polish economy. Okay, And even though in 1930s, he made a case for market socialism by the sheer fact of being a loyal Soviet fellow traveler. So he had to promote Soviet-style economy for Poland. So he defended centralized planning, total centralized planning, at least until 1956, the year when um, the cult of personality, Stalin's cult of personality was exposed and he switched back to his concept of market socialism. Anyway, so a few biographical remarks about Oscar Lange, a very interesting uh, character. So you can Google this name, interesting man. Anyway, back to his argument, market socialism in 1930s, he made what he was convinced in, okay? Even though I repeat later, he for reasons of political expediency he had to support the stalinist economy but deep inside he was convinced in market socialism so let's see how he tried to debunk uh, Mises, the mises argument oscar lange said yes you're right the soviet economy socialist economy in soviet union was dysfunctional why because everything was planned by the state so what needs to be done what needs to be done you need to plan commanding heights you need to put the state in charge in charge of so-called commanding heights it means foreign trade major factories the big plants industrial plants okay banks banking sector 
military industry. But as far as small restaurants, retail trade on the ground, it should be handled by the market. Okay. Plus, what prevents you from establishing market relationships among governmental factories? Okay. It doesn't it doesn't make any difference, he said. We may have um, in charge of big factories, private ent entrepreneurs. Let's say one shoe factory is um, headed by a private entrepreneur. And another shoe factory is headed by another private entrepreneur. It does make any difference if we put in charge, uh, if we confiscate this factory in the state would own this big factory and another big factory shoe factory also will be owned by the state and the state would uh, appoint managers socialist managers to navigate these factories to manage the production in this factory he said what prevents these two state factories to compete with each other <laughs> that's what he argues he said we need to uh, create market but um, it should be state controlled market because all big factories would belong to the state and they would compete with each other. See, interesting argument. He said, yes, Professor Mises, you pointed something crucial. So you can, um, I agree with you, he said to Mises, that we cannot be um, in a situation when uh, enterprises don't compete with each other. But we can change the situation. So. We still can uh, control all major factories. All major factories still can be controlled by the state. But if you allow to compete with each other, conclude agreements with each other, everything will be fine. It's like market. Okay. He also said that Socialist statisticians, socialist accountants would carefully look at the situation on the ground, what people need. Okay, If, for instance, there is a shortage of shoes, these accountants would increase <laughs> the price for the shoes. If prices for shoes, if we have a lot of shoes, nobody buys them, the socialist accountants, accountants would lower the prices for these shoes. So basically, we have this, in the hindsight, at least on my part, I can see this uh, ridiculous attempt to play market. And that's what later uh, market economists, they said, what Lange wanted, he wanted to give a right to the socialist, to a socialist government to play market, like children play toys in a sandbox, okay? Or like children play in a war, okay? Or like children... Uh, at, uh, a play in uh, in plastling plastling figures okay building some kind of uh, toy enterprise what he said was essential for market socialism is that the state i repeat should control the commanding heights and down below yes we should allow small restaurants or in agriculture peasants to work on the land okay so this mixture have capitalism have socialism and at the same time he said in these um, state controlled enterprises we also should allow them to compete with each other but and that's when uh, Hayek steps in Hayek steps in he said, how can you say that state enterprises can compete with each other? Yes, they can comp compete with each other. But the problem is that these socialist managers, these socialist managers do not risk their own money. See, I purposely put it here. Socialist managers do not risk their own money. They are just managers. 
So their status, their identity, as I'm using this modern uh, current expression, their identity is totally different. If a socialist manager put in charge of something, he is or she is more worried about his or her place, how to report to his uh, superior in order to look good, instead of risking his own money. It's a totally different status. If you don't risk your own money for profit, so you are not, uh, it's not a private enterprise. So you're only concerned about your position. Plus, accountants on the ground, statisticians, how can they again calculate all the prices? Okay, you might take into consideration prices for uh, which are relevant today, but what about tomorrow? So each time we need this army of thousands of bureaucrats to figure out the prices. So it's a ridiculous bureaucracy. It's done on the ground by people who risk their own money. So they decide where they should invest, how many shoes they should produce, should they produce or not. So they take into consideration their own money, their own risks. Socialist managers are not motivated as private entrepreneurs who risk their own money. That's what Hayek pointed. Hayek said that um, whether we like it or not, the markets do spontaneously coordinate the economy because, and he called this uh, tacit, tacit knowledge. So on the ground, uh, millions of deals, millions of responses on the part of small entrepreneurs, small businesses, restaurant owners, decides the prices by the word of mouth, by reading the news. You know, people on the ground decide. Are they afraid to invest into something or they should invest something? Should they buy stocks or they shouldn't? So, and it, you cannot control this process. It's a, a practically impossible to control because what basically we come to discuss here, to debate here, Hayek said, we debate here is how we organize our economy how we organize our uh, political system, and on top of this, how we organize our knowledge. It's very important. So Hayek actually goes further than Mises. He puts down, he uh, brings to our attention the fundamental philosophical question. How do we treat knowledge? How do we treat knowledge? A socialist argues that knowledge should be controlled from one center of power. It should be centralized knowledge. So the assumption is that the army of statisticians and accountants can, from up above, calculate all the prices. But Hayek said, it's a utopian dream because life is always richer than any kind of social engineers can imagine. So you can calculate, you can engineer a good society or some exact prices, or you can uh, plan your prices for next month, but the next day everything might be changed. So it's like, uh, remember, uh, the best way to describe what Hayek had to say is to quote a famous uh, German poet. Remember there was a German poet named Wolfgang Goethe, Goethe? G-O-E-T-H-E, Goethe, Wolfgang Goethe, who um, in his poem, uh, poem, Dr. Faustus, he said, um, the theory is dry, my friend, but the tree of life is blossoming. Okay, so just to emphasize that you cannot control the life on the ground. You cannot control the prices on the ground. You cannot control people's emotions. You cannot control people's sentiments. You cannot control irrational desires of people to do something, to buy something. You know, sometimes entrepreneurs make irrational decisions, okay? Because life is, life cannot be planned. That's what Hayek said. You cannot plan the life. The life is unpredictable. And he, um, 
outlined his views, and I recommend this article for you to read, Hayek, in his landmark uh, work called On the Use of Knowledge in Society. You can find it on PDF online. Okay, And he said, in those societies where knowledge is centralized, like the Soviet Union or Nazi Germany, National Socialist Germany, economy, political life, science, eventually would go down. So those regimes which centralize knowledge, eventually they retard themselves, retard themselves, even though they might not realize in a short-term perspective, they think, oh, am I doing great thing? We mobilize resources. We might build this. We might um, shut down all airplanes. We might shut down all... Um, kind of harmful enterprises. We are going on a nationwide, on a global basis. We are going to impose some human-oriented economy, okay? Instead of trying it in local areas a little bit, okay? And that's what Hayek said would bring disaster when you impose one blueprint for an entire country, like economic blueprint, according to your own imaginations, because some people think, oh, I have the best plan. And to the present day, we have people around us, you know, who think, oh, I have the best plan than politicians. So, and this plan should be imposed globally on everybody. And that's how we will go to the bright future. And if you don't accept it, you are bad apples, so you should be shut down. So, Hayek said, um, in order to be successful, the knowledge shouldn't be railroaded, imposed. One knowledge, one particular knowledge shouldn't be imposed on entire society, on entire globe. The knowledge should be decentralized. So there should be as many centers of knowledge as possible. The scientists should be debate. Different groups should be challenged each other. And there is no consensus about things, he said. That's human life. There is no consensus. It's always ongoing debate about how well we should organize, organize our life and it goes on the ground, this debate, okay? Because it's up to people on the, us, people on the ground, to choose the options. Or maybe we disagree about options. Or maybe we should allow different options to coexist with each other, to naturally see which option might work, okay? And that's what he said. In those regimes which, where we have, um, uh, for example, scientific knowledge decentralized, in his lifetime, uh, there were uh, two big uh, examples of centralized and decentralized knowledge. For instance, in the Soviet Union, all science was centralized, which eventually retarded the Soviet science, okay? Because Soviets did not allow, for instance, different schools of thought to compete with each other. Unlike U.S. Uh, in 1940s, 1950s, at that time, they had competing schools of thought in science, and of course, eventually, they could develop certain um, economic projects that succeeded. Because in debates, in de debate, decentralized knowledge enriches society. The centralized knowledge retards society. That's basically what the argument uh, Hayek made. Okay. And he said the answer is decentralization. It's like in everywhere, in every case, the political decentralization, um, economic decentralization, scientific decentralization. Okay. And of course, it starts with the freedom of speech. It goes to economic debates. It goes to political debates. It goes to cultural debates. Okay. So it's not only about prices. That's what he said in his work on the use of knowledge in society. It's not only about prices. Prices, it's only one small part of our society. How knowledge is used in our society should be understood on a wider scale. Okay, It's applicable to culture. It's applicable to political life. But... Unfortunately, 
and here I posted this cartoon just to show you. Look, logically speaking, um, Hayek, Mises and Hayek, they did defeat the arguments of socialists. And here you can see Lenin is dead and Hayek uh, exonerated, which eventually happened in 1970s, 1980s, when the centralized socialist economies, they started to crumble. Not only in Soviet Union, but in China and India, partially socialized economy in Africa. We will talk about these societies. Uh, in UK, uh, 1950s, there was an attempt to introduce limited socialism. So they started to retard the economic development. But, and that's where it's important to bring to our attention one more time this zeitgeist, the spirit of the time. Mises and Hayek were defeated. De yes, defeated. Even they made a good case against the socialist um, reformers. And by the way, the argument against Lange made by Hayek was that, yes, you Lange recognize the part of the problem, you allow uh, market a little bit, but eventually you cannot play market. Eventually you too retard, you, you do allow a little bit of outlet for market to exist within the socialist community, socialist commonwealth. But eventually you do retard yourself because you do not allow prices to be used to uh, to be used in, for capital goods, for commanding heights. Okay? You still want to control at least big chunk of economy. Yes, you may allow something on the ground, but you still, the big chunk of economy and the longest system, market socialism, belong to the state where interests of managers, their motivation was totally different from private entrepreneurs. Okay. But what Mises and Hayek argued went against the sentiments of the time, against the dominant notions. So that is why... Uh, by the way, Lange never responded to this um, article written by Hayek on the use of knowledge in society. Okay, And everybody assumed that Mises and Hayek were defeated. They were so marginalized, nobody heard about them, and that was it. Okay, Everybody considered that Lange won the debate, and that was it. It's because masses of people, especially during Great Depression, they did want the big welfare state. They wanted socialism. A lot of people did want socialism or communism like in Soviet Russia or fascism or national socialism like fascism in Italy. It's a very close to socialism or national socialism in Germany. It was the people's sentiments on the ground. And that's where I um, sometimes take issue with uh, uh, conservative um, writers who said that oh socialism communism was they were imposed on people no they were not imposed on people and that's one of the my big arguments they naturally grew from the ground the people themselves wanted them okay because it did match their expectations for example during great depression and even in such individualistic country the united states in 1930s we had a huge chunk of society that came to sympathize with socialism. American Communist Party increased its numbers in 1930s up to 100,000 people. Okay, There was a bunch of uh, socialists in um, governmental departments on the FDR. Hundreds of them. It's, it wasn't because some Soviet Union infested them American governmental structures. You know, there's a book, by the way, published uh, by Diana Diana West um, called uh, American Betrayal that she said, oh, Stalin, evil Stalin. Yes, of course, he is evil, but she argues that Stalin planted thousands of people in U.S. Um, um, State Department everywhere, like socialists were everywhere. So it looks like there was a grand plot. You know, there was no plot because on the ground there was this, whether we like it or not, there was a sentiment on the part of huge chunk of society that um, sympathized with these notions of socialism. So that is why under 
FDR, we had in 1930s a bunch of these people who sympathized with socialism, or at least with Soviet Russia, not because they were some kind of agents. Yes, they were agents, but again, 80% were not agents. They were sincerely convinced that socialism was the way of the future. Okay. So market ideas, and look at the slide, my last bullet point uh, makes the point. Market ideas did not fly with the majority of elites and population at that time, 1930s, 1940s. So, um, oh, pardon, I misspelled this word. It was uh, uh, martial sentiments, nationalism, class warfare, okay, collectivism, socialism, communism, all these um, different political projects no matter what they promoted they still were unanimous in uh, one thing that the state should control economy okay so that is why we may say that from san francisco to moscow there was a common sentiment on the part of the elites and the population that um, the big state was to control the life in the in the country and it was good that's what people thought it was time of the big man time of the dictator time of strong presidents remember again i'm not going to talk here everybody knows stalin was a dictator dictator hitler was a dictator and communism national socialism but even in this modest versions we see for instance fdr who had um, authoritarian sentiments as well you know although he could not uh, fully express them because uh, there was a checks and balances installed in the u.s system but still this guy really wanted to pack the supreme court with uh, what uh, 10 more judges you know he wanted he had this dream to squash some institutions in u.s uh, he also uh, was elected four times to the uh, position of president because people um, uh, on the ground believed in him so they treated him as this uh, semi-father of the nation okay they kept his portraits so there were some uh, i would say um modest authoritarian notions okay of course it was not it cannot be compared with stalin and hitler but still the time it was the time of big states big men strong leaders and um, it went against these notions of such marginal figures as Mises and Hayek, there were a few of them, because it was it was the time when people were thinking big, when um, the majority of people in Europe sympathized with socialism, at least with different versions of socialism, not necessarily with communism, but sympathized with social democracy. Okay. And uh, on this note, I would like to end uh, my class today. Thank you for your attention. And I will see you next.